Hello, everybody. Thank you for being here. I'm thrilled um, to be starting this uh, lecture series after our first four days of workshops at the Totem Pole Park. So this series, Totem as Monument and Archive, is um, workshops, hands-on restoration workshops at the park, as well as this lecture series. Um, we have two lectures. This is the first, and another one in Tulsa on August 20th at the Center for Public Secrets. So um, you're kind of here to see the foundation of what our inquiries are. Um, we have been developing some of those inquiries through the workshop series. We've had a number of amazing presenters out at the Totem Pole Park, and we've been doing a lot of hands-on workshops as well. Um, we're now currently working on the Fiddle House, which is um, the, the um, Hogan-inspired um, structure that is now the gift shop and the little museum at the park, and so we're working on restoring that. Um, and what you're gonna hear today are some amazing people who come from a very like diverse variety of perspective on kind of establishing what and how a totem pole park in Oklahoma is. What that means, what that means from a photographic background, because I, you know, I've been working on the totem pole for about eight years doing the restoration project, and I I'm sure a number of you have been out there. I'm not sure if everybody, but the totem pole, um, as you can see, is a really tall structure. Um, it's about 90 feet tall from the base to the very top of it. And I continued throughout the years to look at it and think these are, like I'm looking at a series of photographs. Um, and I've thought a lot about like, you know, what Ed Galloway's um, source material would have been. So that's kind of why we're here, kind of starting to think about what Ed was referencing in the 30s and 40s, what these, you know, native um, faces are, where the totem pole as a form came from, especially in Oklahoma, where the native populations are not totem builders. So a lot of these questions are going to be developed here. Um, I'm really excited for our panelists. The majority are from out of town. Um, I am going to slowly be introducing those people. We're going to kind of do um, about 10 minute presentations for everybody. We'll then open it up for a panel discussion and then there will be a kind of Q&A with the audience. Um, we are recording this, so if anybody has a question, this is for later for the Q&A. Um, I'll pass a microphone around, make sure you speak into the microphone because that's the only way we can record this. And I'm gonna start by introducing Pablo Barrera. Um, he is our moderator and will be guiding us throughout the presentation today. Pablo Barrera is the associate curator at Oklahoma Contemporary in Oklahoma City. He collaborates with local art communities to produce exhibitions and in explore innovative strategies to support formal and informal learning of art. He is committed to raising public awareness of indigenous culture and generating gallery experiences that invite audiences of all backgrounds to engage with art. Pablo has independently curated shows in London, Seoul, and New York. Pablo is among the first group of curators at Nathan Art Space, Connecticut, and serving as independent researcher at Yale Peabody Museum of Natural History, and as graduate advisor for Yale University Art Gallery's first student-led Native American art exhibition. He holds master degrees from Yale University, History of Art, and Harvard University Regional Studies, um, East Asia, and a Bachelor of Arts from the University of Pennsylvania. He is a Paul and Daisy Soros Fellow in 2012 and a Fulbright Scholar in South Korea in 2011. Pablo was born in Chicago to immigrant parents 
His father is a mem- <clears throat> excuse me, a member of the Wisharitari. How do you? What is it? Wudiaritari community in Mexico where Pablo spent his formative years. Pablo is a first generation high school, college, and, and grad school graduate and works to amplify the invaluable role native artistic perspectives contribute towards globalizing the arts. So I will invite him up to the stage. Everybody clap, he's amazing. <laughs> you do that. Thank you. Can everybody hear me okay? I think this is working. Hold on. How about now? Is this better? Those in the back, can you hear me? Yeah. Wonderful. It's uh, welcome. It's my pleasure to be moderating this conversation with a mixture of scholars um, and people from the, from the community here. And it's been uh, an incredible honor to be called by Aaron uh, to come and just kind of see how we can approach this very layered topic of the Ed Galloway Park. It's something that's been of interest to me for a while. One of the speakers, Apollonia Apollonia was one of the first people that actually uh, introduced me to the park uh, when coming through. And so it just sort of stuck in my mind as this oddity that is still very much a, a great snapshot of the culture of Oklahoma. And uh, I think we have a great series of talks uh, put together in order to be able to really parse what is going on. Before we begin, um, it is customary amongst um, a lot of indigenous groups, uh, well before academics have actually popularized this, to do something akin to a land acknowledgement. Uh, and really what that is, is just to think about the legacies of the place that we're gathered here today. Uh, I see everybody straining to hear. I'm going to move this microphone just a little more. Hold on. Um, I'm not going to take my mask off because I was exposed to COVID by one of my coworkers a few days ago, and I just want to make sure nobody here is going to get it or put it on the <laughs> podium. So if you'll, I'll try my best to speak as loudly as I can into this. Is this better? Okay, great. <laughs> and I'll just hold on to this one so nobody else has to share it. Um, I'll just have to do this one-handed, sorry. So yeah, just to um, begin with a little bit of the history, we're going to touch on some of this in terms of the context because we have the privilege of being speaking to some academics, some scholars, some historians, um, people who are very deeply aware of their community history. So rather than uh, just go over the broad strokes of what this place is. Um, we will touch on how this is now the tribal lands historically of the Osage, the Cherokee, and the Muscogee Creek Nation, uh, now the Muscogee Nation, for those of you who are up on the, on the lingo. Um, and we are also you know, going to go a little bit into sort of like the history of the different kinds of communities that have crossed here, especially the settler colonial people who came and settled the region and formed this into a state. Um, but I want to do something similar to what this park, I think, represents. I want to go into a history that is here, specific to Claremore, that many of you may not have been taught, or if you do know, not something as popularly known. Um, and it is the Claire Moore Mound War of 1817. Is anybody familiar with that war or that particular incident? I see a couple of heads shaking. Yeah, so what happened is in 1817, about 20 years, a little bit more than 20 years before uh, Indian removal, before the Trail of Tears, the Western Cherokee teamed up with colonial settlers, uh, people of European descent, to try to take over portions of Osage territory. Uh, Claremore was named after a series of chiefs. It's a clan name. Um, it's been spelled many different ways, but that's where the word Claremore comes from with the Osage Nation. And basically what happened was that there was a band of uh, people who came together, who joined forces with European settlers to try to oust the Osage. Uh, they waited until the strawberry moon harvest when they knew that most of their skilled warriors and even skilled women were gonna be gone on a weeks long hunt. And they basically attacked their village. Uh, and so what happened there was that the Osage retaliated by attacking the Western Cherokee for the next 20 years uh, with, the, with extreme prejudice to basically establish that this is not going to fly. Um, so that's an interesting little bit of history that I think a lot of folks don't know that predates the Trail of Tears and talks about how there was already disputes and issues uh, happening here where we are having the talk today. Um, so just to begin with that, I also want to talk about uh, Ed Galloway Park, just to kind of give you a brief overview of what I found interesting about this and that I think the um, different speakers are going to be able to talk about more in depth. Thank you. Is it not going? Oh, hold on a second. Do I have to move it over? No. Oh, got it. Okay. Hmm. This is not. Got it. Should move over. Can anybody see that? Okay. 
Okay, so there it is. So we talked a little bit about context. Let's talk about Ed Galloway's context. So he's somebody who learned art at the turn of the century, retired in the 1930s. So what was he thinking? You know, what was really on his mind? What was his training? Um, and I think that's a really important question to really make sense of what you see uh, when you come to visit the park. It's not just this sporadic idea that came out of nowhere. Um, we have the arts and crafts movement that was occurring in the face of industrialization. We have the Art Nouveau. Just a good little you still can't hear me? Let me try this. I'm going to yell into the mic. I hope that's okay. <laughs> so yeah, the context of Ed Galloway is that we are looking at somebody who was educated during a time when the arts and crafts movement was very important to the nation. It was a way of nation building in response to industrialization, a way to kind of bring artists back into the scene who are being replaced by machinery. That's the rise of the Art Nouveau movement, of Art Deco. And this is where you also start to see strange things creep in, like surrealism. Uh, you might be thinking Dali. Uh, this example that we have right above that is the uh, Frank Lloyd Wright sculptures that were done uh, based on the Winnebago tribe culture titled Nakoma and Nakomis in 1929. And this is just to show you what's on people's minds. Uh, if you look to the right to the World's Fairs, even before that, in the late 1800s going into the early 1900s, we have representations of indigenous people, not necessarily by indigenous people, but by people who collected their works, uh, people who studied them, people who really felt authorized to be able to speak on their behalf. Uh, and then if you look over to the right, I'm sure some of you remember the Oklahoma New Deal post office murals. Uh, this is something that was in the works for a while before it was officially launched in the 1930s. And what you're seeing here is an example of Stephen Mapope, um, an artist who did this uh, beautiful work that is kind of similar to some of the aesthetic that you're going to see today when talking about Ed Galloway. So this is the ecosystem in which this artist is operating and responding to. And then finally, the intention. Uh, just a warning to anybody who's culturally sensitive about these particular uh, imagery. We do have owls in this next slide. Um, Ed Galloway says, and I quote, all my life, I did the best I knew. I built these things by the side of the road to be a friend to you. And yet there's this uh, culturally insensitive representation of a bird that had he actually talked to his neighbors, he would have known not to represent that throughout the park. And there's a lot of owls uh, within the Totem Pole Park. Uh, also, it begs the question of, who is the audience? Um, there's this really uh, sincere intention by Ed Galloway to do art for the public. And I think there was also a sincere intention to do the, as he says, the best he could, given the information he has. And so the wonderful thing about this park is that it is a testament to the American education system on, um, on indigenous culture, as well as indigenous art. And we're gonna unpack that a little bit today with our speaker. And finally, labor. Um, this is something that I think is really important to discuss. Ed Galloway is known for having shipped in just like by hand wheelbarrows of sand from the nearby creek bed, taking in stone, making this all by cement. It was really a labor of love. This was not done with public funding. This is a retired person who had a career as an artist who really felt that he needed to express something to honor the indigenous people and he really put his back into it. And yet, despite all that wonderful intention, um, he still kind of fell short of being able to address these communities. But at the same time, he's somebody who was just sort of mesmerized by this concept of labor. Um, I believe we're going to talk a little bit about Diego Rivera in one of the upcoming talks. Uh, but this is a great example of what's happening at the time in the 1920s, 1930s. People are thinking about labor. People are thinking about how to uh, approach ideas of labor. People are thinking about the value of work. And this is something that Ed Galloway has been struggling with uh, as he made this massive monument to what he calls uh, the Indian. And then finally, what are the consequences? Um, I want to give a little credit to one of my colleagues, Kaylin Roach, who did a master's thesis on monuments and approached it through the methodology of looking at commons. We have a wonderful tool nowadays where we get to actually see the effects of what it is that we have done in the past and how people are responding it today. And this is just one quick example um, of somebody who, if I may read just a second, this was truly an odd place to stop. I had heard about the stopping point on the Mother Road, Old Road 66, so we had to stop. Sad to say, I was disappointed. But I'm sure back in the day, this might have been a hoot for people during the 50s. Here's a little bit of the history. And then, of course, you know the history about this being claimed to be the largest totem pole. You know about the 11-year period from 1937 to 48, where he focused on the totem. Um, and then utilizing 28 tons of cement, 6 tons of steel, 100 tons of sand and rock. Tribute to American Indian features 200 car pictures with four 9-foot Indians near the top, each representing a different tribe. That's accurate, but it's also not the full story. 
Um, the centerpiece totem pole rising from the back, an enormous turtle sits in the midst of a beautiful nine-acre park. The park also features Galloway's 11-sided fiddle house, which again, not enough context to really think about what it means that it's an 11-sided, which actually Galloway corrects as a 12-sided house. Um, and then previously houses Hank Hart fiddles. Artifacts made by Ed Galloway and visuals of the park development are also on display in the museum. Throughout the park are numerous colorful totems that display a variety of Indian folk art. That last sentence is important because basically we are uncritically accepting that Ed Galloway has become the authority on Indian folk art, despite the fact that have nev never been part of the community and having never consulted anyone from the community. So we are now living with the consequences of one of the most famous roads in the United States with now an increasingly famous park uh, that is educating people. And so the questions are, where do we go from here? And to that, I want to turn it over to our speaker. Thank you. All right, so our next speaker is Annalise Flynn. Um, she is in from Wisconsin. She is an independent curator and art historian based in Sheboygan, Wisconsin. She manages spaces on behalf of the Kohler Foundation. Flynn's work centers on highlighting vernacular, vernacular creative activity using material, collective memory, and place as research pillars. She holds a bachelor's degree from Northwestern University's Medill School of Journalism with a minor in art history and a master's degree from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago in art history, theory, and criticism. <laughs> thank you, Aaron, and thank you, Pablo, and thank you to all of you for being here. Let me find my thing here. There we go. Okay. Okay, great. Um, so, I have been given the very large task of taking y'all through the genre of artist-built environments, which is what we consider, or what I consider anyway, uh, the Ed Galloway Totem Pole Park to be a part of. So the first thing that we're gonna do is try to define this sort of undefinable genre of art making. So artist-built environment. It's a personal space, like a home, garden, or studio that's been fully transformed into a continually evolving, site-specific, and life-encompassing work of art. So these are combinations of art architecture and landscape architecture. It includes religious grottos, spiritual, devotional, and mystical sites, gardens, ephemeral yard shows, architectural inventions, expressions of loneliness and survival, homes fully transformed, artist museums, and many other created spaces. So I just wanna give you a couple of examples to start with, just to show you the range of these places. So this is Kia Tawana's Ark. Uh, Kia Tawana was a one-woman demolition crew in Newark. She took down uh, blighted buildings in Newark and salvaged the material to create this ark that she intended to be her home in a church parking lot um, until the city of Newark forced her to dismantle it in 1989. This is Loy Bolin. Uh, Loy uh, took on the persona of the rhinestone cowboy. I'm sure some of you are familiar with the rhinestone cowboy. Um, later in his life, um, he bedecked his entire uh, Macomb, Mississippi home inside and outside with glitter. This is all glitter Elmer glued onto construction paper. Um, he created his own custom rhinestone nudie suits. And he even had rhinestones affixed in his dentures. <laughs> and the home the entire home and the dentures are now in the collection of the John Michael Kohler Art Center in the Art Preserve in Sheboygan, Wisconsin. 
This is Lewis Lee, who landed in Phoenix, Arizona after immigrating from China in 1920. Uh, he filled his entire yard with rock and found object sculptures. Uh, Mr. Lee has passed away, but the environment remains in his family, but it is unfortunately closed to the public. And then this is Charlie Stagg. And Charlie Stagg's studio compound was built on the site of his family's former hog farm in Vidor, Texas, using bottles and other cast off materials and the inspiration of Buckminster Fuller's geodesic domes. So this is just a sample. There are hundreds of these types of places all over the world that use all different kinds of materials. Um, so the umbrella term artist built environment is, is pretty tough, but it is all encompassing. Um, so to narrow the scope of this down to 10 minutes, um, I was thinking about the title of this lecture series. So Totem as Monument and Archive. And then I happened to watch a really great Mellon Foundation program recently that helped bring everything together for me. Uh, it's called American Monuments, American Cities. It's on, oh, you're nodding, she was there. <laughs> it's, uh, it's online, it's recorded, it's so good. So, you know, check it out. Um, so the discussion began with a, a very simple question. So what makes something a monument? Um, and the answer starts to, to roll in. And as I'm sure you guys may be thinking too, so it's big, it's permanent, it's typically Eurocentric, it's established by people and institutions in power, it promotes a specific narrative or perspective, it takes up public space, like the Washington Monument here. And then they ask the question, how do we redefine and expand our notion of monuments for the future to sites that are made within community, that are accessible, that create space rather than just take up space, that bypass traditional mechanisms of power, that don't come from the top down, but rather the bottom up, and that are reflective of the communities in which they're created. And I immediately, while I was listening to this program, was like, oh, I know a lot of places like that. Um, so I'd love for y'all to keep that question in mind um, as I introduce the next two makers to y'all. So the first is Miss L.V. Hull of Kosciuszko, Mississippi. L.V. purchased her home in 1974 with wages from domestic work when she was in her early 30s. L.V. was an artist her entire life, but it wasn't until she had access to her own space that her practice really took off in remarkable ways. And that seems to be a hallmark, having access to your own space in terms of environment creators. She started as a collector, filling her home with precious items, some that she kept for curated displays within her home and others that she sold to collectors. She eventually began painting using primarily found objects as her canvas and acrylic paint from Walmart. She de developed a signature style, bright concentrated colors, dots, clever sayings. She called this doing the LV. She also called the discrete pieces that she made her pretty things, which I particularly love. And she even adorned herself in the work, painting many hats, pairs of shoes, and even clothing. And a visitor once remarked, I don't know where the art stops and LV begins. Her artwork began to radiate outward into the front yard, eventually creating a dense, evolving, prismatic installation. Not everyone appreciated LV in her yard, but she was, <laughs> she was beloved by many, and her home was a beacon of creativity and personal pride in her historically African-American neighborhood. And now the home and collection are gonna be the foundation of a new arts campus right in her neighborhood in Kosciuszko. Uh, so full disclosure, I'm a part of the team that's managing that project, um, and I wanna talk about it for a little while. Um, so, Thinking about the ways that these places operate within the communities in which they're made, the way that they touch the communities um, that these artists are a part of. Um, one of my colleagues working on this project is named Yafit and Yafit Smith, and his uh, grandmother's from Kosciuszko. He spent summers there growing up, and so he met LV when he was seven. And he always talks about LV as being his first encounter with somebody who truly lived a creative life on her terms the way that she wanted to. And it was so meaningful to Yafit. It was um, a huge inspiration to him as he considered the trajectory of his own life. So he started in accounting 
and then he became a lawyer, and then he became a screenwriter, and he ended up making a documentary film about LV that's not yet released, but I'll tell Erin and she can tell y'all <laughs> when it comes out. Um, and uh, Yafit is now a partner working on this project. Um, the LV, the Kohler Foundation came in and uh, conserved a large collection of LV's work last year and gifted it to a new organization in Kosciuszko called the Arts Foundation of Kosciuszko. Um, and uh, this collection will now be a part of the LV Hull Legacy Center, which will have a rotating uh, collection of LV's work, um, exhibitions, a creative residency, public programming, and bring economic opportunity to LV's neighborhood. And the goal is for the site to be a monument to LV's creative spirit and her independence, her warmth, and her exceptional generosity. The Legacy Center will be anchored by LV's home, which is on the same block as the new facilities, uh, and it was added to the National, the National Trust for Historic Preservation's list of America's 11 most endangered historic places in May, and preservation of the home will begin soon. And that's me in the middle, and that's Yafit standing next to me, and that's Johnny Hunt, LV's neighbor, uh, in the overalls, and then Miss Benny, who is LV's cousin, is in the green in the middle. Um, so this is really a, a community, um, this is a community project, and it's very exciting. Next, I wanna introduce Eddie Owens Martin <laughs> of Buena Vista, Georgia. Um, Eddie was born into a sharecropping family in 1908 in rural southern Georgia. He escaped an abusive father when he was 14, and he took on sex work and other forms of hustling to get to and eventually survive in New York City. So in New York, Eddie took in all the culture that he could, so museums, libraries, theaters, nightclubs, and drag balls. This is a young Eddie in drag on a trip to Pontiac, Michigan. And he absorbed these cultures and traditions and then squirreled those influences away for later. In his late 20s, Eddie fell severely, severely ill while visiting his mother in Georgia. And then while ill, he was visited by, quote, a great big character sitting there like some kind of god who entreated Eddie to follow its spirit. And so Eddie did follow the spirit. He was eventually visited again and told, you're going to be the start of something new and you'll call yourself Saint Ohm, E-O-M, Eddie Owens Martin, and you'll be a Pasakoyan, the first one in the world. And so um, after uh, Eddie's mother passed away, he inherited the family property and moved back to Buena Vista and created Pasaquan. So, yeah. <laughs> um, he began erecting walls, adorning buildings, and creating sculptural works. Uh, and he didn't actually begin painting the property until 1967 after he took to a trip to Guatemala and Mexico where he saw Diego Rivera's mural, Dream of a Sunday Afternoon in the Alameda Central. He began painting intricate designs throughout the property, um, African, pre-colonial Mexico, and Native American cultural and religious symbols, as well as motifs inspired by Edward Churchward's books about the lost continent of Mu. And here I see some similarities between Eddie and Ed Galloway. So they're absorbing these cultural images and then refracting them back through the lens of their own uh, experience for their own creative purposes. And then these are a couple of Pasaquian sentries guarding the property. So like LV, Eddie also adorned himself as part of his practice. Here is St. Ohm in his full ceremonial dress. Uh, though Pasaquianism was a religion of one, Eddie did not proselytize or was not interested in other people becoming Pasaquians. Um, and he had this compound on the outskirts of town. Eddie was still a very active part of the community of Buena Vista. He came into town, he attended town hall meetings, and there is a pretty famous story that he would drive his Cadillac into town full of cats and he would get out and do his business and then he would whistle when he was ready to go home and all the cats would return to the car. Um, so Eddie did create his own mythology um, around himself um, for probably a variety of reasons, uh, one of whom, which was probably good for business because he did tell fortunes and um, purportedly sell pot at Pasaquan. Um, but I have to imagine uh, that this was also, the self-mythologizing was also um, some self-protection as well, being a somewhat out queer man in the South in the 
50s, 60s, 70s. Just another couple of pictures of Pasaquan. This wall, all of these people, these figures here are based on people that Eddie knew. So his mother is one of these figures. Some drag queens that he knew in New York are some of these figures. There are landscapes. He used all kinds of spiritual imagery, mandalas. And Pasaquan uh, was also a, a preservation project of the Kohler Foundation and is now owned and directed by Columbus State University in Columbus, Georgia. Um, it's becoming a pretty robust uh, creative hub in the South, um, and it's a huge asset for the students who uh, attend school at Columbus State who are currently doing hands-on preservation work um, at Pasaquan. Um, they have an artist in residence uh, program, and so I'm showing you a piece that two of my friends made, Jonas Subura and Ar um, Alex Gardelman, that portal that's in the back. So they said of their experience, to experience Pasaquan is to be completely enveloped. You are covered, swarmed, swallowed by St. Ohm's irrepressible vision. We wanted to capture such a feeling. We wanted to use that sensibility as a pathway for making our own portal, connecting our lives in Wisconsin with this incredible site 1,000 miles away in Georgia. Artist-built environments have always been centrally informative to our practice, and Pasaquan stands out amongst the many we hold close. It's the breath of making, the totality of a life lived through commitment to a creative vision where every nook and cranny of the artist's life is a part of their creative pr production, which pulls us towards Eddie. So back to the original question, um, I think that we have these very intimate monuments to lives well lived all around us, and that oftentimes these artists so generously create and leave behind places that are extremely complex but also offer many possibilities for continued creative work and to deepen our understanding of what it means to be in community in radical ways. And I feel like that's what we're doing right here with the Totem Pole Park now. So thank you and thank you, Erin. Thank you, Annalise. Um, our next guest is Emily L. Moore, who is in from um, Colorado. She is a, the Associate Professor of Art History at Colorado State University, where she teaches courses in American and Native American art history. Raised in a settler family in Ketchikan, Alaska, Emily continues to work with Tlingit, Haida, and Tsimshian, um, communities to document their art and histories on the Northwest Coast. She is the author of Pre Proud Raven, Panting Wolf, Carving Alaska's New Deal Totem Parks, which is from the University of Washington Press, um, published in 2018. So please welcome Emily. Thank you so much, Erin, and thanks to all the panelists, Pablo for moderating, and thanks to all of you for coming out. It's an honor to be invited. I never thought I'd be invited to speak on research on totem parks in Oklahoma, but um, <laughs> it was fun to visit the Ed Galloway Park this morning. And I guess my role today is to try to give some context of totem parks um, in their place of origin. Uh, they're a very strange invention, even on the northern northwest coast. But um, growing up in Ketchikan, Alaska, I grew up next to two New Deal totem parks that had really been kind of mocked in scholarship as kind of strange government inventions. And indigenous communities there really talked about them in a different way. So um, I'm just hoping to give some context today for totem parks that I believe Ed Galloway received postcards from. His family had visited these totem parks in Alaska in the 1940s, and so this may have been some source material for him as well. So um, the research that I worked on for my recent book was really based on these six New Deal totem parks built during the Great Depression 
um, the Civilian Conservation Corps, or CCC, which was President Roosevelt's kind of hallmark work relief program to put people back to work during the Great Depression. And that included indigenous men in Alaska. They actually had to fight for the right to be enrolled in the CCC. Originally in Alaska, it was only open to settler men. But um, the Alaska Native Brotherhood, which was a civil rights group in Alaska, fought for the right to enroll indigenous men. And the number one program that they recommended that the CCC do was to restore 19th century totem poles. And you can see on this map, just to help orient you, this is Alaska, huge, huge state. And I'm mostly talking about this southern, southeastern panhandle down here in Tlingit Ani, Tlingit lands. Um, this is also the Haida, the Simshan. So it's this kind of area here. And you can see the, the six New Deal totem parks that were built by the CCC between 1938 and 1942 are really concentrated down in the southern southeastern Alaskan pan panhandle. They also restored some poles up in Sitka in kind of central southeast Alaska. And just as a quick overview of this program, um, the CCC in Alaska was overseen by the US Forest Service. Unlike down here in the lower 48, I believe it was usually the army, but there wasn't a strong army presence in Alaska until World War II. So it was the US Forest Service that oversaw all of this. And that's really key because at this very moment, 1938 to 1942, the US Forest Service is battling indigenous people for the Tongass National Forest. Um, Tlingit and Haida communities were really asserting Aboriginal claims to the Tongass National Forest. And so this is a really fraught relationship <laughs> where indigenous men are enrolled in the CCC under the supervision of the US Forest Service. And at the same time, they're pressing a lawsuit against um, the Forest Service's right to oversee Aboriginal lands. So I'll go into that a little bit more at the end. But um, just to give you a basic overview of how these, these totem parks came to be in Southeast Alaska, um, Initially, in 1938, the U.S. Forest Service did a kind of reconnaissance mission. They went around southern southeast Alaska documenting 19th century poles, which had been um, left behind when indigenous communities were really pressured to move to larger communities for church and school. So they had been pressured to leave behind these communities leave behind totem poles, which most missionaries condemned as heathen objects, even though they were never worshiped. And um, I realized I'm, I'm so used to giving this these kinds of talks in the Northwest Coast where people are more familiar with the function of totem poles. But just to, to kind of briefly give you some context, on the northern Northwest Coast, at least, Kutiya, which is the Tlingit term for totem pole, it means large object carved with a chisel. And they were used as memorial poles, often to mark um, an important person who had died. A memorial pole would be erected at a kuih or a potlatch um, to commemorate the specific crests of that particular clan from the person who had died. They can also be heraldic poles, which would tell of an important story of, of kind of world phenomenon, the origin of salmon. Why do salmon always come back to their birth stream? How did Raven give the world light? These were all um, heraldic stories that could also be told in different poles. So they were never worshiped. They were never about um, gods that people you know, venerated. It was really more about these kind of heraldic stories, clan crests, memorializing important people. And unfortunately, when missionaries came in the late 19th century, they didn't see it that way. And so um, a lot of the poles had been burned, purposefully destroyed, or left behind. And by the 1930s, many of these late 19th century poles were in a severe um, state of decay, and that's why the CCC came in and decided to restore them. So the next step after identifying all of the 
the poles that were worthy of restoration, according to the U.S. Forest Service. The Forest Service worked with um, the Office of Indian Affairs, what is now known as the BIA, Bureau of Indian Affairs, to identify indigenous claimants to the poles. So who had originally commissioned the pole, who was their descendant, who was alive in the 1930s, who could sign for it. Because a really key problem with this totem pole restoration program was that it was CCC money that was going to restore this, right? It was taxpayer public funding. And that funding could not go to restore privately owned poles. So these poles that had been the property of particular clans all had to be signed over to the US government, made public property in order to use federal tax dollars to restore them. So this is just one example of um, these really complex memoranda of agreements that are now at the National Archives, um, all filed away with US Forest Service. And I have tons of text here, but I just wanted to highlight um, some really key shifts in these um, that the CCC totem pole restoration program entailed for these communities. The first is that people who were signing over their poles, their clan poles for restoration by the CCC had to agree, first of all, to preserve the poles. And that was not the, that was not the customary practice on the northern Northwest Coast. You allowed a pole to return to the forest if you needed to commemorate someone or tell the story in a, of a heraldic pole, you would commission a new pole, right? You didn't try to preserve the old ones. If you've been to the Pacific Northwest, you know it rains a lot. And cedar, even though it has incredible um, kind of anti-rot properties, even cedar will eventually rot. And so that was just part of the life cycle of a kutia. They allowed that. The CCC, though, is now saying we're going to preserve these poles. There's a new emphasis on preservation. Um, indigenous claimants also had to agree to erect the poles in a publicly owned site. Again, it could not be private property. It couldn't be, it couldn't remain on Forest Service land um, in the Tongass National Forest. So uh, many of these totem parks were sited in um, 20th century contemporary indigenous communities. And then they also had to be considered as community property. Clans could no longer claim them as, as individually or clan owned property. It had to be the community. These were really difficult, um, difficult changes for indigenous communities to kind of grapple with. This was not how they had approached Kutia in the past. Once those memoranda of agreement were signed, the, the labor, talking about Pablo's idea of labor, um, the, the labor really began. And you can see some poles, some of the 19th century poles, they could restore by inserting kind of new cedar blocks. I don't know if you can see on this image, but um, some of the rotten areas could be chiseled out and, and new wood inserted. But some of the poles were too far gone, and so many were replicated. And you can see in the photo on the far right, um, the 19th century pole laid out by a new 20th century pole. They transferred measurements with calipers from one pole to the other. So there was this kind of effort to create replicas. After they had carved the poles, they were creating them in totem parks, which was an incredible amount of labor in itself, um, raising all these massive poles, 40-foot poles that weigh thousands of pounds by hand. And the parks themselves were very strange. I, want, I, I like this photo comparison just to show you how in the Haida, this is a Kaigani Haida village of Haukan on southern Prince of Wales Island. And you can see the poles as they would have been in the village in front of clan houses. So the particular clan poles tied to a particular clan house. Um, you can see the canoes that are up on the beach, the houses facing the beach. The, the totem poles acted as almost kinds of address markers, right? Like I know that's the Yagulanus clan because they have the bear and the double killer, the double fin killer whale on their totem pole out in front of their house. 
So that would have been how these totem poles would have appeared in villages in um, the late 19th and early 20th centuries. By the time the CCC gets a hold of them and they start to erect them, as you can see in these very gridded totem parks, they, were, um, they had these nice gravel paths. The idea originally was to have signage to interpret all of the <coughs> totem poles. And um, in my book, I go into more detail on the US Forest Service architect who was laying out these totem parks. And he was really modeling the parks on the French and English landscape tradition, trying to either put them on a nice grid or the kind of serpentine, picturesque paths of an English garden. And again, his intentions were to, they're complicated, right? He's, he's doing something completely alien to the northern northwest coast, but his intentions were to try to get more Americans to see these totem poles not as strange curiosities, but as kind of great monuments in a monument garden. So putting them into a context of a sculpture park that would be more familiar to your Euro-Americans to get them to kind of revere the poles in a new way. Just thinking back on the kind of um, history of totem parks, um, Pablo had a better slide of this. I'm sorry I didn't realize it was so blurry here, but the earliest kind of temporary totem parks are probably the World's Fairs. In 1893, there was the famous um, Columbian Exhibition in Chicago, and mostly Kwakwakiwak and Haida poles that were brought in um, with Franz Boas and George Hunt, if you're familiar with that history. The first t permanent totem park that um, that I know of at least was in Seattle, and this was a pole stolen from southern southeast Alaska from the Tontakwan Ganachari clan of Tongass Island. There were some Seattle businessmen who were up on a cruise trying to secure business contracts with Alaskan gold miners, and they, um, while the Tlingit were out at their summer fish camps, went into Tongass village and cut down this massive pole and erected it in the downtown's Pioneer Square where a replica still stands today. So that, that has always been a really important totem park. Um, but it's a good question to ask why, why the federal government in the 1930s and 1940s wanted to create these totem parks in Alaska at all. It was a huge investment of federal funds and um, I guess I just wanted to remind everyone that in this interwar period in particular, there was a real interest in defining a distinctively American art form. What was American, what could our art traditions um, in the United States claim that was not European? And so indigenous Native American art really held a kind of pride of place in this interwar period. And the, the Indian Arts and Crafts Board, which was a, another federal New Deal pro project, um, they hired totem pole carvers, John Wallace, who worked for the CCC as well in Alaska. They hired him to carve for a 1939 World's Fair. And then the totem pole that he carved there in San Francisco at the fair later stood in front of no less than the Museum of Modern Art in New York City for Indian Art of the United States, which was a blockbuster exhibition took up all four floors of MoMA in 1941 about indigenous art of the United States. You can see again that kind of theme of wanting to claim this particular indigenous art for the nation's art tradition. It's more complicated to, um, to figure out why indigenous communities agreed to cooperate with this Forest Service program and the CCC program, and this will be my kind of last point. Um, so if we know the federal government was really interested in funding this restoration program in part to create a tourist route up the Inside Passage um, that would attract tourists to Southeast Alaska, that would also provide jobs, they hoped, for indigenous communities, selling model totem poles and moccasins. For indigenous people though, um, and this was what was so impactful about 
this is what really mattered to me in my own research, was talking with um, the few CCC carvers who were still alive at the time and with their descendants. And what people really emphasized to me is that, you know, everyone's always assumed that we just joined the CCC for jobs, that we were desperate during the Great Depression to have employment. But you have to realize how important these parks were for our own cultural and political prerogatives as well. Remember that for 50 years up to this time, missionaries, government officials had really suppressed totem pole carving, and now the federal government was paying people to carve poles. Now the federal government was collecting, as you can see the, the um, camera on the right-hand side there, they were recording stories of the poles that elders were telling. And so yes, it's like this weird tourist program, it's this weird federal government program, but at the same time, that is Henry Denny telling his grandchildren the story of the Nech Adi clan pole, which he had not been allowed to kind of publicly do, you know, for a generation. So, and the other part that I mentioned at the very beginning is that the, these totem parks actually became a really important part of Aboriginal claims in the 19, starting in the 1930s, and the, the um, settlement was actually in 1968. So it was a long legal battle for these 17 million acres that had been um, made by presidential proclamation under Teddy Roosevelt in the early 20th century. Just all 17 million acres of what was Tlingit and Haida land had been declared as a Tongass National Forest. And indigenous people no longer had the right to harvest totem poles without ask or harvest cedar trees for carving without asking the Tongass without asking the Forest Service. Their fishing rights were severely limited as well. And so um, what's so interesting to me is that these totem parks, because these totem poles told specific stories of clans and their histories on the land, many of these poles documented Aboriginal claims to that land. And by getting the US Forest Service to record those claims and enter them into court documents, <laughs> this became the, a, a really important way to kind of channel federal interest in pretty totem poles that could attract tourists, but that also got the government's ear to listen to these deeper indigenous claims that were recorded by those poles. So I hope that makes sense. This, this is a famous um, sockeye salmon pole in the Cloak Totem Park. It, you can see at the very top has a bear holding a salmon, and this had always stood at the base of Cloak Creek, an important sockeye stream owned by the Nastedi clan. And um, so this became that clan's kind of document of, of ownership of that creek, and it was entered into U.S. Forest Service records and ultimately used in the, in the lawsuit that proved Aboriginal claims to the Tongass. So there are all kinds of examples of that. Um, the parks today are really important to the indigenous communities um, where they're located. People are continuing to replicate the poles now and to preserve them through that, that means. Um, a lot of the CCC carvers' descendants are important carvers in Southeast Alaska today. So it was really an important program um, to create these totem parks, as weird as they were, as touristy and government um, kind of bureaucracy as they were, they're also really important to indigenous communities. So thank you so much for inviting me here today. I'm, I'm putting my email up in case anyone has questions. And this is um, the book where some of this was documented. Thank you so much, Emily. Um, I am going to be introducing two people next. Um, the first is Dr. Russell Cobb. Russell Cobb is a writer and academic currently in residence as a visiting scholar at Cal Berkeley. He is associate professor in modern languages and cultural studies at the University of Alberta where he his work bridges the worlds of print and radio journalism with the digital humanities. 
His journalistic work has appeared in Slate, NPR, and The Nation. He is a contributing editor and frequent contributor to This Land Press. His books include the ebook single Heart in Darkness from 2013 and the edited collection The Paradox of Authenticity in a Globalized World from 2014 and The Great Oklahoma Swindle, Race, Religions, and Lies in America's Weirdest State from 2020. Um, our, they're, they're co-presenting. So, um, Apollonia Pina is an interdisciplinary researcher of Muscogee, Chicana, and Scots-Irish and French lineage. Apollonia's life as an indigenous activist started with her native and Chicano parents and informs her work in academia and community involvement in Northeast Oklahoma. She um, is the developer of an indigenous-centered STEM camp for Native youth. Her research interests include non-Western practices in science and math, indigenous sexuality and womanism, and pr promoting Natives in STEM. She is the founder of Green Corps Medics, a street medic crew that provides care to those in need during direct actions. Pina is also one of 10 2021 to 2022 on Being Fellows. She enjoys scouting rare books, rock and roll, origin stories, and connecting the dots. She resides on the Muscogee Reservation in Tulsa, Oklahoma with her son. So, please come up. You're going first. And I think we're gonna do this pro wrestling style and I'm gonna actually just tag tag Apollonia and she's gonna come and you know show her best moves. Um, it's a Google slide, yeah. So uh, so when I come bounding off the stage, um, that's why. Do you want me to get it? No. Uh, oh yeah, it is. Yeah, that, that that's the one. That's the one. Thank you, yes. Awesome, okay, um, so, yeah, I, I, we're, again, like we're gonna, uh, Apollonia and I are, are, have been research partners on the, the project I'm gonna talk a little bit about. Um, who knows who Charles Page is? Pretty much everybody, okay. Um, well, pardon as I, pardon me as I, go through the standard history that you may already know about Charles Page and the Sand Springs home, because I need to set that up. That is the monument. The archive is what is missing from that monument, and that is the project I've been involved with in maybe the past five years um, with Apollonia and with other, other collaborators I have. So to set, so I'm gonna set the stage First, um, Charles Page. Why? Oh, first of all, why would I be talking about Charles Page? Ed Galloway uh, ran shop for in the Sand Springs home. The Sand Springs home was founded by Charles Page when he came to Oklahoma very very early in statehood. He initially came to the Tulsa area and bought a piece of land in what is now Sand Springs and essentially made it his own town. Um, it's, it's a really unique urban environment, I think, in, in the world. I mean, you think of like com company towns. Well, this is a one-man, in, in a lot of ways, a one-man town. They would, and still to this day, the main road from Tulsa to Sand Springs is the Charles Page Boulevard. The, ha the high school in town is Charles Page High School. Um, this is the main statue, and right in the middle of downtown, Triangle downtown. It's a monu mon monument in bronze done by a very famous sculptor named Laredo Taft uh, in 1930 of Charles Page. So it's, it's a very iconic and very monumental uh, uh, world that we're talking about. And I think that's kind of interesting as we're talking about monuments and archives. Um, all, all these things that, that I when I listen to 
um, the earlier present presentation to think about what is, what is a monument. It's big, it's grandiose, it takes up space. Now, as this home was being created, it was technically called the Sand Springs Home for Widows and or uh, for Orphans, and then there was a widow's colony. As this is being created, Charles Page is thinking about populating it in his sort of almost like a sort of mm, his own vision of what education could be. And legend has it, and I'm going to say legend because a lot of things in the life and times of Charles Page are the, are the stuff of myth. Um, the real archive is, is missing. But in the myth, mythic, mythic version, which may or may not be true, um, Charles Page was walking around downtown Tulsa one day in, I think, 1911, 1912, and he saw this really interesting wood sculpture outside a drugstore in downtown. And uh, it, was, it, it may have been one of these sculptures, that uh, wooden sculptures, that you can see today of, of, of Ed Galloway's. But it was certainly of Ed, it was, it was a work by Ed Galloway for sure. Because Page asked the, the owner, he said, who, who carved that statue? That's an incredible. He said, this man, Ed Galloway, showed up here from Missouri. He's kind of a self-taught artist. He's a, he's a craftsman, and, and, and Page hired him to be a part of this, this world, essentially, that he was building in Sand Springs. And I say world because it was an orphanage. It was a widow's colony, but it had everything within it. I mean, there are even, at one point, they'd even had a, had a, it had a roller coaster. It had a zoo. Um, and in fact, one of the things that you can see, still see, and the, the, the original orphanage is torn down, but um, this is, I think, part of what was the zoo. You see a lion here. Um, this is on the grounds of the Sand Springs home today, and these were done by Ed Galloway as well. So he and the students from the Sand Springs home were creating a lot of this art in a, in a vernacular style, in a popular style that that didn't hew to one, one sort of school. Uh, if you go to the totem pole park, I was, I was actually kind of blown away. I was sitting there, we were sitting there having lunch the other day, and the, the director or the, whoever was staffing the store said, look, those, those chairs you're sitting on, those were created that see, there's a plaque, 1917 Sand Springs Home. And because he was sort of so prolific and his students were so devoted to him, they were sending, they'd send wood to him to, carve the fiddles and that sort of thing. This is one of the is famous on the, the left here, my left, uh, is one of those famous sculptures. And I think that may have been the sculpture that Page saw. I, I can't swear by that. Um, in any case, this is a story that gets told a lot and, and, and because it has a sort of, because it has this monumental and kind of, kind of larger than life aspect to it, this mythical aspect to it, mythologized aspect to it, it, it misses a lot of what is the archive. Um, for reasons that are quite complicated that I won't go into right now, a few years ago, Apollonia and I were, were researching some of the original allotments, and she'll speak, uh, I'll, I'll tag her to talk about more about allotments, but we were researching some of the original allotments in the Tulsa and Sand Springs areas. And this one name kept coming up over and over again in conjunction with Charles Page. And the name was of a boy named Tommy Atkins. Now, you're not going to see any reference whatsoever in the Sand Springs Museum. I take that back. You're going to see one. <laughs> one reference to Tommy Atkins. Um, but as it turned out, much of the wealth that went into building everything around the Sand Springs home was derived from Page's claim to an allotment in Western Creek County that sat on the top of the Cushing Drumright oil field. And <clears throat> I can't overstate how important this oil field was it's sort of forgotten today, and it's a little tangential to Tulsa, and Tulsa loves to talk about the Glenpool, but the Cushing Drumright oil field was found right before World War I started, and it really powered the Allies in their 
new wave of petroleum-fueled machinery um, to victory. In fact, two-thirds of the light, sweet petroleum in World War I came out of this quite small oil field um, for, that extends from Cushing to, uh, around Cushing to Drumright. So I, I can't, also can't overstate the amount of wealth that was coming out of that. Now, I had read that in this official biography of Charles Page that he wanted to find this missing boy, Tommy Atkins. He was out there somewhere and he, does, he wasn't sure. Actually, a lot of oil men were out there trying to look for him. Thomas Gills Crease was looking for him. Sepulpa businessman, H.U. Bartlett was looking for him. Uh, J. Paul Getty, all, you name it. Harry Sinclair, you name it. They were all like trying to figure out who this kid was. Page had a, th Page had a theory and his theory was there was, there, Tommy Atkins was dead, um, but his mother was this woman named Minnie Atkins. And uh, there's Minnie Atkins. Now, Minnie Atkins, um, he, Page wanted to find her and in this sort of wild goose chase that goes from Oklahoma to Northern Mexico to Seattle to British Columbia and back again, uh, he found her and convinced the world that she was the one true heir of this boy, Tommy Atkins, and <clears throat> that she had signed the only valid lease on the Tommy Atkins allotment to drill for oil in the heart of this Cushing Drumright oil field. So this, as it turns out, was the most contested oil lease in Oklahoma history to this day. Um, and there is virtually no reference of it whatsoever. There's a passing reference to it in one of the ex exhibits in the Sand Springs uh, Museum. There's nothing about it in any of the, the monuments that we see. Um, so I have been kind of haunted about why. You know, why, this is, we're talking about a case that went all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. It started in a court small courtroom in Sepulpa, Oklahoma, and Creek County in 1914, but was not resolved until it got to the U.S. Supreme Court in 1922. Um, and there are still many, many, many questions about the validity of the claim, whether Tommy Atkins even existed, and whether who, who Charles Page claimed he was. was. So in any, in any case, and I, I, I could go on and on about this. I know, I know a you know, Apollonia would tell me to reel it back in here because uh, I tend to get excited about this. But I think it's important to think about that just in terms of like, what what are the mon what are the monuments we have, and what are the missing arc what is the missing archive? And so I don't know a whole lot about Ed Galloway, but when I think about his work, and I think about his work within the home, I think about and the work later at the Totem Pole Park. I think about these responses that people had and continue to have as we see a sort of monumental version of what Oklahoma is, what historians would call the master narrative of the place. In other words, the story that the, the, story that the place likes to tell about itself. What is the story Oklahoma likes to tell about itself? Yes. Can we talk about it after? <laughs> because, yes, there, because I, I, I couldn't find much information on this kid or his mother. And I went to various archives. I, I ended up at the National, um, the National Archives in Washington, D.C. And there is boxes and boxes and boxes and boxes. It, it hasn't been printed. It's only been printed twice because it cost, in 19... 22 to print the record it cost two thousand dollars in 1922 because it is it is hundreds of thousands of documents to think that 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 kind of case has never been written about ever um and i feel a certain responsibility about it but i, but I can talk to you about that later i just want to get to the uh, what i what i think that it does in kind of pulling out the strands of 
what the Sand Springs home was, and it's complicated, right? I think it's just, it's a little bit like what Annalise was talking about, about, um, I'm sorry, Emily. Emily was talking about, about the, the totem pole parks. These, on the one hand, we sort of like go, well, that's, that's cultural appropriation. Um, that's not good. But on the other hand, it's like things are complicated and people ha act in ways that we don't always understand and make sense of a world that they are given, right? And, and I'm gonna, and, and, and I can see Apollonia is ready to go on this one because I, I know I'm gonna pass this off to her because I know she's gonna talk about this. Yes. Yeah, yes, so uh, spoiler is he ended up with all this money um, and really the real build out of Char the real build out of Sand Springs when you think about it as the industrial, what did they call it? Oh, the, it was a big deal at the time, 1922. Um, now no one's ever heard about it. Um, but it, it was, the th it, and it was held up in court under a receiver a, a federally appointed receiver because the really the, the federal judge at the time thought it's very unlikely this kid ever existed and that the Supreme Court is going to find that this is at all in the words of the U.S. attorney at the time, the attorney general no less, it is an elaborate fiction. Um, I could go on about it, but what I, what I, what I want to, I want to sort of <laughs> turn back to my partner here um, to say that that as we kind of think about um, and there she is um, as we think about how do we I don't want to say tear down monuments because I mean that's not what I'm interested that's not personally what I'm interested in I'm interested in understanding the process of mythologization if that's a word uh, mythologizing that occurs as these kind of stories get calcified and obscure what are, to me are, are more, almost more interesting stories, the stories of, of the Ed Galloways, of the Minnie Atkinses, of the, of, the, of the people of the place that did not receive the you know, $230 million, <laughs> which was what essentially that, that lease ended up being worth. Um, so I, before, just as I, ta I tag out here, a um, couple slides. Speaking of monuments, I, I have a kind of a morbid sense of humor. I'm sorry. Um, but this is the Oilton Cemetery. I just think it's very interesting that it's like you have to enter the cemetery through o two oil derricks. Um, and uh, this is uh, Apollonia when we, uh, the two of us were kind of obsessing over this story. And we went out on, on the original Tommy Atkins allotment. We weren't supposed to. It's private property, not encouraged. You didn't hear that here. Um, anyway, we got stuck in some Oklahoma red mud. And the <laughs> all these boots are under our, our rental car. Anyway, um, thank you. Tag. You're it. Thanks, Mom. And thank you, Russell. I might tag you back in here shortly. I don't know. I didn't know we were tag teaming like this. Um, hello, thank you all for joining us. I don't want to stand on a stage if I can help it. So I'm just not going to stand up there. I feel weird standing on stages. Apollonia Pina Chahodovskuros, Idrogu Omolegodos, Dolsa Amidalvados. Interesting that we're here in Claremore, so I just introduced myself in Muscogee Creek language, that's what tribe I am. I am from Tulsa, but I was born just right across the street at Claremore Indian Hospital. You wanna talk about a place that has a very complicated history? Claremore Indian Hospital. <laughs> that's all I'm gonna say about that for now. So my focus is, uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the history of what was going on in Oklahoma with tribes during this time that Ed Galloway was building and creating this totem pole park and mostly gonna stick to the five tribes. And I say that intentionally. Towards the end of this, you'll probably understand why I don't say five civilized tribes while we're here. We don't say five civilized tribes anymore. We just call them five tribes. And, you know, when I was talking kind of informally to some of my native friends about 
Erin Turner's work and what she's doing at the Totem Pole Park and how I was happy to collaborate with her on this. Um, just from a few, I would say, from the Native community, I heard some, well, why is it being restored? Like, Ed Galloway was just an appropriator, and he was a white man. Like, why is he even creating totem poles? That's not even a thing that we do here in Oklahoma. Those things are all true. Like, my tribe, Muscogee, Cherokees, the five tribes, to we don't do totem poles here. We do other stuff. Um, but I would ask that um, we cannot view Ed Galloway, we cannot view the creation of this totem pole park strictly through the lens of 2023 politics, culture, and ideologies. I think that would be really easy, a little bit cheap, and too dismissive. There are criticisms to be had here but we need to take off our 2023 lens and view it from the era of which Ed Galloway, a white man, was creating these monuments and the world in which he was living in, which is not the world that you and I are living in currently. Oklahoma is a complex and confusing uh, state with, a, I would say, it's a little confused about its identity. Um, it's this mishmash of 39 tribes, most of which were forced here. Um, white settlers that came here for oil. Here's a fun aside about me and Russ and the little thing that we do is I think it's kind of a fun story how he and I met. He was working on a story about um, uh, the gathering place, right? And how it was on this Creek Indian man, Tuckabuchi's land, his story got published before mine. I was also working on it, so I ended up just friending him on Facebook, as you do, and DMing him directly, being like, I should have written that story from a Creek woman perspective. Who are you? <laughs> um, but we ended up becoming friends, and the more I got to know Russ, and we did become friends and research partners. He's a homie. Uh, what's kind of interesting about he and I being research collaborators that I've not encountered anywhere else is, you know, I'm a Skogie. My family was forcibly removed here to Oklahoma. He came here because his family comes for oil. So he's coming from the white oil background. So we seem like an unlikely pair of researchers, right? But I think that's what gives us this really unique and richer research collaboration history. So as I was saying, Indians and white settlers here in Oklahoma have been interacting for some time. Um, something we definitely need to discuss is allotments. Allotments happened to a lot of the tribes here in Oklahoma. It was the Dawes Act of 1887. The intention and purpose of allotments was to take tribal reservations and break them up into smaller parcels of land to give an idea, when my family, um, for Creek Indians, Muscogees, uh, when we were given allotment, it was 160 acres. For Cherokee, I believe it was 80 acres. My family was given 160 acres of allotment land. Intentionally, this was all intentional, talking about the land swindling that was happening, right? Um, in order to keep that 160 acres of allotment, you had to be working that land, farming it, you had your animals on it, grazing. So whenever it was given to my family, it was checkered up. 30 acres here, and then maybe three miles down the road, here's 12 acres. And then over here, here's an additional 26. You think about a native person in Oklahoma um, during the 1920s, 1930s. Uh, we didn't have cars. You were considered rich if you, if you had a horse. So how on earth would you be able to go and work all of that land when there's miles of separation between it? It wasn't just one lump, oh, 160 acres, all right here. And so if you weren't working that land, it got taken away from you. I think now of that 160 acres that my family was originally given, eight acres remain. And there's probably about 60 names attached to it in my family. As soon as uh, another uh, complication, this was, again, intentional, is that as soon as a Muscogee person was less than half-blood Indian, 
which that's a different conversation about blood quantum that we won't get into. But once you were less than half blood, then that allotment land was taken out of trust. Then it could be put up for sale at that point. So that was just another way that local government was um, ensuring that they would get access to our lands. Native people, we were not given full citizenship until 1924. And even then, it still took another 40 years for all states to allow us the right to vote. Even so, Jim Crow style policies prevented easy access for being able to vote. Again, just going into some of the things going on during this era that Ed Galloway was making this park. Um, the Urban Indian Relocation Act of 1948 happened, but it was initiated in the 1950s. And again, that was designed to move Indians off of reservations and into urban cities and areas. The point of that was to further assimilate us into white society, taking away our culture, removing us from our tribes, our communities, our culture, and our lands. Um, if you can't kill us off, which they tried, or you can't change us, which they tried, then absorb them until they disappear into mainstream culture entirely. So, <clears throat> Ed Galloway, the only thing, and correct me if I'm wrong on this, right, but in my research, Ed Galloway, the only thing that he knew about Native Americans um, was what he learned through postcards, was what he learned through National Geographic. National Geographic, I can only imagine, had any photos of Native American people. It would have been in the kind that uh, came from Edward Curtis or a similar style which is problematic in its own right. You know, like, here's the stoic Indian. We don't ever smile and make jokes. Um, <laughs> so, um, Ed Galloway did not have a formal education. He did not have access to information the way that all of us do now. I think that whenever he was creating this park, he was creating it because he saw these images of us as native people. He lived in Oklahoma. He was probably neighbors with a number of Native American people, but again, for these complicated legacies of our interactions with white settlers. Putting it further into perspective, um, for a lot of Native people living in Oklahoma in the turn of this century, 1920s, 30s, 40s, we did have some interaction with our white neighbors, but I would say we mostly kept to ourselves Anytime we interacted at length with white settlers, it did not turn out good for us. Um, it was in 1978 with the American Indian Religious Freedom Act, which I think is always kind of shocking to people. It was illegal for us to practice our native ceremonies and cultural ways up until 1978. Before that, the Code of Indian Offenses uh, enacted by the United States government there was this whole set of rules and regulations to where we would get jailed for practicing our cultural ways. And so a lot of us just kept to ourselves. I know that my great grandfather, Mose Wiley, he was a uh, Hilatiya. Uh, he practiced medicine, but he also was a Baptist preacher because he kind of had to literally walk in both of those worlds. So on the surface, hello, I'm a Baptist preacher. But I know that secretly, um, when we did our stomp dances, he would be participating in that too, but you just didn't talk about that publicly, and you sure as heck didn't talk about that with your white neighbors. So, Ed Galloway, I think, saw some of what was happening, perhaps, to Native people here, even if he didn't necessarily interact or talk with us. I don't believe he had any friends that were Native Americans. What he did learn about us was again through what was printed by white presses at the time. So in his humble, if not misguided way, he did create this park because he was trying to honor us in this weird way, a man of his time, because he saw us as a race of people that were going to be killed off 
that maybe he thought that he was witnessing our extinction in real time. So there's a lot of things that we could be critical of this park for, yes, but we have to put on our hat of what life was like in Oklahoma during that time period. And yeah, Noble Savage. <laughs> but um, so I think if I were to meet Ed Galloway today, <laughs> I think he'd be a person that I would probably sit down, have a beer with, some sweet tea, a barbecue, but I wouldn't want to be super critical of him. Instead, I would rather just engage in a dialogue with him about what it actually means to be Native American and have these difficult conversations, which I don't think he was in a position to be having with any Native people back then. But, uh, Thank you very much, Apollonia. Um, we are gonna start a Q&A, and I'm gonna invite all of the panelists to sit up on the stage, and while they are situating themselves, um, please go ahead. I'm gonna just say um, thank you to David Anderson, the director of the Totem Pole Park. Thank you to Bobby Carey, who is not here. She is one of the board members at the Rogers County Historic Society both of whom have supported my work for years, and I really, really appreciate them. Um, we were able to do this project through um, the Oklahoma Heritage Preservation Grant from the Oklahoma Historical Society. And I also just wanna mention a couple people who are not here, um, but who were a part of the programming and presentation um, first at the workshops, and also we have another series um, on August 20th. So Reese Martin of the Oklahoma Route 66 Association, Keith Austin, District 14 Tribal Counselor at Cherokee Nation, Norm Sands from Way of the Sacred Mountain, honoring missing and murdered indigenous women. Russell Cobb came out and spoke with us as well. Um, Heather Valenzuela, who is my assistant in the project, um, Oklahoma Visual Arts Coalition, Graham Lee Brewer from Cherokee Nation, national investigative reporter at NBC News and president of the National American Journalist Association who will be speaking August 20th, Yataka Star Fields, Osage Cherokee and Creek muralist and painter also speaking on the 20th and Ashanti Chaplin who is a cultural producer, producer and multi-form conceptual artist. So we hope you guys come out for that conversation as well. And without further ado, please, um, when you are passing the microphone around, please make sure that it's turned on to green. Um, and this is also for any questions that might occur, please wait to ask them. I would like to bring the microphone to you. We are recording this discussion and the only way for me to record it is for you to speak into the microphone. Thank you so much, Sharon. Can everybody hear me okay? I'm, I'm gonna try to yell into this microphone too. I'll keep it as close as I can. I'll hold the mic this way. So to your last point, Apollonia, what a, what a great moment that now we get to talk to indigenous people uh, up on the stage. Uh, we get to do what Ed Galloway could not do, which is uh, not too many indigenous people in this room, but at least way more than Ed Galloway. It's exponentially more <laughs> than Ed Galloway was ever able to discuss with. Um, and I want to kind of start backwards. I want to start with um, what you talked about, Apollonia, what you and uh, Russ, what you introduced um, in terms of this discussion. And as anybody here is inspired to ask a question, please just raise your hand and jump into the conversation, please, uh, because this is meant to be sort of a more casual uh, part of the talk. So Russ, I want to begin with the archive. We have some questions about the archive. We have this value placed on the archive. We love our documents. We need these documents. We are a very legalist society. Um, just philosophically speaking, we, we love legalese, we love, uh, we love contracts, we love all these little pieces of evidence of these different interactions, all these uh, impersonal convolutions based on the alliances that we actually have uh, with each other. And you have done a lot of deep dives into archival material. You have published on a lot of this stuff. Um, in what ways have you seen that change, the, uh, as you quoted, um, 
the stories we like to tell about ourselves? Through archival research? Just through your own published research. As people become more informed, what ways have you witnessed this changing the stories we like to tell about ourselves? Or has it at all? It certainly for me it has, personally. Um, as a fifth generation Oklahoman, um, descended from, on my mom's side, people who came, settlers who came during Indian territory, and having seen the, these master narratives through, not only through sort of formal education, but also through art, through visuals, through Hollywood, um, understanding the way, what is, what is in the archive uh, breaks that apart in a lot of ways. And it, but in ways that are very hard to parse, it's not always, it, no one is, no, there's no telegram in the National Archives, for example, that says, we're gonna get all their land and swindle them. <laughs> but rather, there's, if you can bring in um, a few people, we'll pay you $5 if you'll get them to say, that you know, um, make some sort of false statements. It, it, it's it's a it's a growing body of evidence that I've seen that paints a picture and in stark contrast to the master narrative. Thank you, Russ. And uh, just to continue that conversation, Apollonia, you made a very good point about what you would do if Ed Galloway were here. Uh, based on what Russ said, what do you think is missing in terms of our approach to share these stories besides the archive? I mean, you mentioned barbecue, you mentioned sitting down with a beer, but what, what do you think is missing in this park? Like, you can't, we can't have you standing there in front of uh, the totem pole talking to every person who drives by, and we can't hire somebody to do that because that would be impractical, but what do you think is missing in this space that would help people start to unpack the things that you see need to be present? Yeah, so whenever I was, um Full disclosure, I go way back with Aaron Turner. Um, we've known each other and been friends since high school. And so um, there's a certain banter that she and I have with each other. Um, and part of that is that because she is a white female, I'm a native female. And so she and I, if she's come to me with questions about indigeneity, native identity, cultural questions, well, I, sing, I do the same with her about white middle class stuff that I don't understand. And so um, making friendships like these where you can have these spaces to creatively, constructively have these dialogues rather than it coming from a place of where we just immediately shame and you know create these negative head spaces for people that are in earnest trying to understand. Um, there is, for a lot of brown people, native people, indigenous, whatever, it does take a lot of mental labor to have these conversations. So we just need to spread it, spread it out and not have it be just a handful of people engaging in these dialogues. Good answer, we'll, we'll get back to that again when we talk about this. Oh, one she, this one had a... Let yes, one second. Let me get you on. I'm sorry, I, um, I'm Native American and growing up, um, also being black in my school, they didn't teach me more about my culture. So I want to know, how did you grow up learning about yours? Oh, what tribe are you? I'm Cherokee. Okay, well, there are a lot of resources for you to learn about your Cherokee identity. You just gotta like go to Tahlequah. That's I'm where the people are. Um, I grew up in a household uh, very Indian in the sense that it was uh, multi-generational. I grew up with my mom as a head of household. That's also Hella Creek. Um, and also my grandfather was there too. My dad was very involved, he's Mexican, and he just lived literally on the same street, but like four <laughs> blocks down. And we all got along. And so my grandpa, Louis Wiley, was a Muscogee first language speaker. 
So I got to grow up hearing that in the household and my mom running the show. And we were very, like, there's, <laughs> you ask 25 different Native people, what does it mean to be Native? And you're going to get 25 different answers because there are urban Indians, city Indians, which I would definitely be accused of. Um, there are rural Indians, there's res Indians, which is a reservation Indians, and sometimes a lot that are a combination of those two. That's where I would identify. There are Indians that are Christian. There are Indians that participate in their traditional ceremonies. And there are Indians that do both of those things. So when we talk about indigenous identity or maybe perhaps how I grew up, I just grew up with a lot of them thrown at me, but definitely I would say I'm like 60% city Indian and then like 40% like rural resi Indian. Thank you for that question. To that point, I do want to stress too that um, not Galloway Park. Please don't learn about Native history through Galloway <laughs> Park. Um, you know, but unfortunately, that is the reality for a lot of people that they only have these archives, these monuments, these um, public displays of narrative, these educations um, that do not speak enough about indigenous culture or the nuances of indigenous culture. So we get this idea that you can just go to one place and get that information, but it's very much rooted in your community. So um, you're here in, in Oklahoma. So you, I hope you can travel to the Carolinas as well um, to look into like, you know, some more information and some more communities that are the people that you come from. And it's a, it's a massive project. And it's also a shame that what we need to find our roots has been scattered, similar to the allotment process that you discussed upon, yeah. But thank you for those questions and thank you for those comments. Um, so I wanna move along to you, Dr. Moore. Um, I'm convinced that Ed Galloway was referencing these parks. Um, these, uh, uh, particularly through postcards, as you mentioned, Apollonia, I, I'm convinced that he was looking at what was going on in these world fairs and what was starting to happen um, as the government was like set establishing the CCC. Um, so my question to you is, why did it stop? There was government backing, there was a national narrative, there was enthusiasm, there was massive investment, not just on the government side, but also through the soft power politics side of the world fairs. So why didn't it keep going? The short answer is World War II. <laughs> That's really when the CCC formally disbanded was I believe it was June 1942, so right after the U.S. entered the World War, um, the federal government just really had to redirect a lot of funds. And in fact, the totem parks in Southeast Alaska weren't quite finished at the World War, and it was a real scramble to finish erecting what holes remained. Um, but yeah, it's, in, it's an interesting question too, because then in the 1950s that uh, you move into this more like termination era, the policies that you were talking about of Indian removal and, um, or not removal, but the replacement policy, right? Like putting the farming people out to urban cities and, and more of this kind of assimilation effort on the part of the US government. So, so it is interesting to compare that interwar period with the kind of post-war um, efforts of the US government. There just wasn't the interest, I think, in paying for indigenous art the same way there had been in the interwar period. You have a question. We have a question. I'm sorry, it's me again. Hello again. <laughs> um, I'm trying to say this in the nicest way. I, is it kind of like copyright and plagiarism of like, because the art didn't originate with him? He kind of like, I don't want to say he kind of like stole it. but Do like you mean Ed Galloway or do you mean? Um, he just like copied it and made it for everyone. I mean, that's, a, that's an interesting legal question, right? Like, uh, who owns the rights to these images that are Did being, like that are being appropriated? But also, um, there is the idea of transformative power of art. I deal with this a lot of times with contemporary artists, where you can take things like Pink Panther, and you can, through the power of transformative art, turn it into something wholly original that is no longer the trademarked or copyrighted entity. So there are caveats that by him building it in his own style, 
with his own hands that even though he's still copying particular styles, it's not an exact faithful replica. And I don't think anybody would claim that. I don't think anybody would want to look at um, the totem pole and say, oh, this is a great um, example of an Oscar Howe. <laughs> it'd, be, it'd be insulting to Oscar Howe. Uh, so I think, uh, I think it's probably um, his particular style shall we call his abbreviated style is probably the reason why it falls safely into fair use. Pablo, I'd like to add some comments to that. Um, I th you're talking about Ed Galway, right? How he kind of like was piece milling things from different cultures, right? Okay. So what we would refer to that is uh, what he was kind of engaging in with him piece milling from these different cultures, tribal cultures, that he was engaging in type of pan-Indianism and definitely an argument can be made for him appropriating native cultures, right? That happens all the time. One of the notes that I had actually wrote uh, that I forgot to say earlier was that when we're considering a place like this totem pole park and you think of the psychogeography of a land, complex history of a land, of time, place, and people, and how what Ed Galloway was doing, um, you know, we, we know more things now about how to respectfully engage with other cultures, with their practices, what's appropriate for us to take from them. Perhaps like we'll cook a dish from Africa or something, but I'm not ever gonna try to claim to be African and participate in their ceremonies, right? Um, and so it kind of turns into this larger conversation two of appropriation of white people appropriating native culture and you kind of see this nowadays with a lot of white folk so many here claim that they're Cherokee that they have a Cherokee grandma it's always a grandmother never a grandfather or a cousin or anything ask yourself why that is princesses there are no such thing um and with that them feeling entitled through these little slips and these little cracks of where it can take us <laughs> go down a slope to where they think they're entitled to our ceremonies and our cultures and our ceremonial practices. And then they start thinking that they are Indian and falsely so. And that's a whole different conversation about pretendians and participating in our ceremonies that I can't begin to get into, maybe later. We have another question Please. right here. Okay, um, I, I feel like I have a little bit of a unique um, relationship to Ed Galloway. He was like a grandfather to my mother in terms of, cause, because he was like a father to my grandfather who was raised in the Sand Springs home. In fact, my grandfather was the first boy that was taken to Sand Springs and, uh, you know, they started in a tent. That was my grandpa. Um, also, my grandfather supposedly um, transported the concrete out there. Now, I don't think he, it was already concrete. He must have transported the, you know, the sand or the rock or something. I wish I had asked more about that while he was still alive. But um, I also i am in possession of over 200 items that either Galloway made or the students at the home made. Um, they got passed down to my mother and passed down to me. Um, I never really thought of any of the images on them as being Native American. Um, he was very much an outdoorsman. He taught the boys to fish and to hunt. And so there's birds and all different kinds of fish. Um, I don't think there's any snakes. I saw snakes on the one thing, but I don't think it has snakes. But um, Owls, a lot of owls. Um, I do have two pieces that are about three to four feet tall that might be considered to be totems, um, but they're pieces of furniture. So I have furniture, I have inlaid pictures, I have fiddles, um, just a whole variety of things. And um, so I, I thought it might be interesting to see if you all think that these images are Native American, because I, I just never thought of them that way. Um, so I'm thinking, well, maybe his Native American influence came after retirement. 
Thank you so much for that comment. Um, in the beginning of the talk, I showed you a public comment that's on the internet. And what I was trying to say with that, and what I was trying to emphasize was that I don't consider Ed Galloway to be a native folk art artist um, for many reasons, but people do. Um, so regardless of the intention, which I talked about as well, he had these intentions to honor as contextualized as they are. And yet the effect remains that because of its position to Route 66, because of the context of the way that this imagery has been consumed and the way that it's been perpetuated, Ed Galloway's part of that now, whether he intended to or not. His intention was clear. He wanted to make art for people to enjoy. He didn't charge. Um, it was supposed to be as a, as a friend for you as you come by and look. And yet we still have the collateral effect that people look at this and go, oh, native folk art. And that's a responsibility that we now have to bear as people participating in the consumption of this particular park. And as the creator of this park, um, he was only able to say so much because he only knew so much. And I think this is part of the reason why these talks are valuable because we're trying to put together all this disparate information. Or even with yourself, you're talking about, two, was it 200 plus objects, I think you said? So many objects is what you're saying, yeah. Yeah, and yet none of this, yeah, but you're, you're still having to guess. You're still having to say things like, I don't think he, <laughs> you know, you, uh, you don't know. That there's, there's so much information that just is not clear because of how muddied this is. And the reason it's muddied is because of how culturally we project onto these national narratives. And I wanna press a little bit on that. Um, Galloway made his park clearly like during and after World War II. Um, there was no funding you know, for this. He just did it of the, of the goodness of his own heart, and he did this for his community. Um, and also the CCC members who continue to carve poles still exist. So my question is, why isn't this still being recovered as a national narrative, especially now that it's more affordable, right? Um, there's no more funding because it got redirected after World War II, but we still have the art producers making it. They're still ready to go why did it stop being the national narrative? I thought the whole point was to take this and turn this into like the whole, this is American art. And um, dare I say, dare I venture into guessing that, is it because the narrative is no longer controlled by certain people? How about now? Can y'all hear me? Great. Yeah, my battery just died on me. Um, so I love what you said about how we need to redefine what these artist-built environments are, that we need to redefine what a monument is in order to be able to contextualize what's happening and what continues to grow and evolve. But uh, I'm just curious, um, are there any artist-built environments that you felt um, can't be saved like uh, i'm thinking about you know like how we tend to go overboard with like cancel culture but are there actually examples that you can think of where this is causing more harm than good and where do you think galloway falls on that scale um yeah that's a really interesting question um in terms of the places that i focus on and am most interested in i would say that not many of them would fall into that category, you know, in, in intentionally. Um, you know, with Ed Galloway, um, I don't think it's up to me to decide the harm that it's causing, you know. Um, I think that what I am interested in is how can we use uh, these places to do exactly what we're doing here, which is dive into these really complex histories 
The thing about artist built environments is that a lot of times they are time capsules that people are using. Um, they're using found objects, they're using cast off material, um, they are active members of their communities and they are promoting their very specific ideas about the world, um, which is uh, obviously gonna be problematic sometimes, for sure. I mean, there's, m yeah, there are many things that are problematic about Passaquan and about um, Eddie Owens Martin, absolutely. So how can we use these as a jumping off point to talk about those histories? Um, and to sort of better understand the ecosystem these artists were living in that led them to make these places. Any questions from the audience so far? If not, I have a quick prompt just to leave us for today um, that everybody can kind of pass the mic on or just leave it on the table as it is. Uh, what, would you, what would you change about the Galloway Park or what would you update about the Galloway Park if you could? Like how would you add to the conversation uh, what would you create uh, that would help us understand it better? Any takers? Um, I just think interpretation is so important. Um, having materials there so people can understand, um, obviously, Ed's side of the story and what he was doing there, but then adding on the layer of how do we see things through today? You know, I agree that. Um, you know, it's complicated when you try to go back in time and apply like a presentist lens onto things that were made previously, but that conversation is so important now to have. And there's such a range, I mean, there are people who are so good at this, there are curators who are so good at this in terms of making that kind of information accessible. Um, and then uh, creating ways for community members to add to that conversation, whether it's through community directed archives, whether it's through oral histories and other forms of storytelling um, to invite people into that narrative. We have a question before you continue, Emily. It's me again. Um, so not just adding on to community conversations, what have we got to add in community art because as we grow old, we become history for the next generation. So it would be kind of amazing that I'm going to, let's say, me, I make my own art there, and I'm 50-something, like the next generation's looking in, and they're like, look at this piece of art that was curated, like generation to next generation. Yeah, I was going to say it could be really interesting to invite an indigenous artist from the Northwest Coast to respond to this park in some way. Um, I think having signage there that, that really emphasizes the totem pole, I mean, it's become such an icon of Indian art, and yet it's from a very specific location. Even across the Northwest Coast, it was only practiced in certain areas, right? The Salish really didn't carve monumental poles, they had welcome figures, but they didn't use poles the same way. So to clarify the kind of the context and, and meaning of, of a totem and why it became so ubiquitous as kind of a symbol of indigenous art. Apollonia, we have another question before you continue. I hope this isn't out of order, or, or I don't, I'm just gonna ask it and <laughs> you all can hit me on the head if you, when you're restoring this, I've seen the park repainted some, but as I see some of your work now, it's very detailed in how you're repainting it. What is your inspiration, or how, where are you getting your ideas as to what the appropriate color and the motifs and things should be? Is that coming from an indigenous understanding, or is it your artistic interpretation that you think these really look good in this spot? How is that restoration coming about, the creative part This of is it? an Aaron Turner question. <laughs> yeah, this is a question for me. Um, so the um, park was initially restored by the Kansas Grassroots Arts Association in the 80s and 90s, who did a lot of research to, by like taking the paint chips that were on the already very weathered totems, matching them to the original paintings of Ed Galloway's that were in the Fiddle House, the, the um, 
museum and gift shop, they're still original to Ed's hands inside. And so they were able to kind of match that. They went to um, paint companies that were alive and well in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, looking at what house paint colors were popular in that time because um, the whole point was to restore it to what Ed Galloway had originally done. He used latex paint from neighbors who would drop it off, they had extra. So that's where you're getting the color scheme from were the house colors um, in that region, in that era. And so what we've done to kind of shift that slightly is just using a paint instead of latex paint, which essentially traps moisture and it fades, it chips, it does all of these things. We are putting on a silicate-based paint, which is essentially crushed stone. They're all natural colors and it has a potassium binder in it that makes a um, chemical reaction to the cement behind, the actual structure behind. It's vapor permeable, meaning that um, the moisture can come and go as it pleases. It doesn't fade, it doesn't chip, and so it's just a much more, um, not only sustainable material, but also um, weatherproof and um, long lasting and all of these really great things. So that's what we're doing in terms of the restoration work. But you're matching it to the color. But we are matching it to the color. So, oh, thank you for saying that, because you can't get the full range of colors that you can with um, man-made colors. And so we approach, there. I mean really it's like, we can't get the hot pinks and things like that, so you'll see a little bit more of a salmon tone, but it's as close as we can get using that material. I don't have anything personally to add at this time. Russ? Don't look at me like that. <laughs> I assume you have, we can have lots of things to say, but what to add. Um, I, I just think it's fantastic. I don't know if this is going to answer the question because I don't know what you would add, but I, I'm just struck by another thing about this, as you're talking about it, Aaron, and you're recreating this, post, this interwar period and then how it changed in the 50s. I think it's like the, the legacy of the 50s in this sort of consumerist culture, conformist culture, uh, where things became so uniform and throwaway that um, I, I wonder if part of the appeal, the resurgence of the appeal of, of the totem pole park, because I've never, actually never, I grew up in Tulsa, never came out there, but I was struck with, we were there the other day, tourists are coming by, it's, uh, a part of this resurgence of the route, route 66, I think there's a real hunger for this sort of mm, public public art space that I know that it's kind of an antiquated term, but kind of a folk art, um, vernacular art that people are making in response to that hyper consumerist culture, conformist culture in which we live. So, you know, I just think it's it's really interesting that, that, that that's happening at the same time we're starting to put these layers, if you will, you know, layers of interpretation on it that connect to uh, disparate, you know, indigenous cultures and, and ways of, of, of doing and honoring um, ancestors in other places. So I, I guess more, <laughs> rather than, than, than taking down, you know, adding more and more layers. Thank you, everyone. So just um, based on these responses, I just want to add to that and say that my concern is now, as I leave this, these doors and head out, is to think about how are we fascinated with adjusting, updating, refining these stories we tell ourselves, or are we just going to be satisfied with repeating the ones that we know? Thank you. Oh, we have oh, one more question. Before you clap. <laughs> we have one more comment or question or whoever Squeeze else would like to. 
Sorry to ask after the buzzer. So I kind of have a half one question that I don't want to leave before I ask. Um, so there's a difference between Ed Galloway's like um, archive of his own design and something like the Smithsonian's archive of stolen objects, right? And I just kind of want to know, like, I have it here, how do we archive in a way that isn't just collecting stolen art objects? And is there a way to archive that's, it's kind of a question of like the ethics of archiving, of archival. I mean, and ownership of, of stuff. I don't know, this is a big question uh, to end on, but can you speak to that at all? I mean, um, I think we've all touched on this, this idea of who's the one that's deciding what is collected, who's deciding the narrative, who's deciding to espouse the narrative what is protected as far as imagery. I mean, Apollonia, you hinted at this, this idea that a lot of these images are not protected because they're meant to be consumed, they're meant to be widely disseminated. Um, that's a question of who's in charge of a narrative. A monument, I think, can be more than just a public work. I think what you're describing also is a monumental collection. Um, and it does the same thing. It tells a story that we want to tell ourselves. And the question is who gets to say it? Kind of touching on that too, um, I'm going to talk maybe about art or like a project, kind of in the context of an archive, you know, I think would fit here. But s say that you were trying to create an archive of like a, a particular tribe or like, you know, a tribe of a region or, or something. Um, the best way, my default answer, is to always do it in collaboration with people from and of that community and uh, having this lateral. Um, dialogue with them. We're so used to researchers, academics coming in, doing parachute research where they drop in, get what they need, data collected, then dip out, and they don't give anything back or they don't do anything that leaves the community better than what they found it in. So some things um, are meant for public consumption. Uh, I could make, for instance, like I, I make skirts and like if I made ribbon skirts, I could sell those to pretty much any tribal person. But if I'm making Muscogee skirts, that's just meant for me. And that's meant for other members of my community and our ceremonies. So it's, it's a complex answer because that's going to be different for each community of what could be in an archive. And then also there's a whole legacy too of many colleges where they took things 100 years ago, 150 years ago, and they're only now only beginning the process, and not all of them, Cop, Berkeley, um, of where they are giving native objects from their archives back to members of that community because it was taken not in a good way. I'd like to speak to that just briefly because uh, on Friday I was at Gilcrease and the speaker was the curator there of, an of the part of the indigenous things and we are reopening Gilcrease with new exhibits and so they have taken and collaborated with nine tribes that we believe Mr. Gilcrease got these objects from in different ways and they have just had in-depth discussions and meetings and evaluations. Some things have been returned. Tribes have either all agreed for them to be displayed and have had input into how they will be displayed and what the stories will be told about them. It's been a process that's been in for um, the works for about three years at least. So it's beginning to happen and I just saw that there are new guidelines for the National Museum Association regarding native and, and indigenous works. So museums are beginning to kind of come to terms with this and figure out ways to um, ma make things better or right as best they can. So it is going on, but it's definitely a work in progr progress. <laughs> Um, if just as a practical answer to your question, I think there actually is one. Uh, are you familiar with OCAP? Okay, th this is what this is what you're gonna go Google later. <laughs> um, OCAP stands for Ownership, Control, Access, and Possession, and those are the four principles governing any kind of 
collection, whether it's data documents that actually form a traditional archives or um, cultural artifacts, is those are the those are the four principles. OCAP, you can look it up, and it I'm, you'll have a better um, a much better explanation than I could give you right now. But anyways, that's that's where you want to look. Forever, um, speak or forever hold your peace. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> hold your peace. <laughs> All right, um, well, look at these amazing people and look at these amazing people and Thank you all for being here. Uh, um, we have refreshments outside, so I hope if you have a little time, please stay. We can have some um, friendly conversations out there and um, just really, really appreciate all of you for coming and supporting this project and um, thank you. <laughs> <laughs>